I posted a quote online. <clears throat> I don't know if you all read it. I'm going to begin today by reading it. And it may at first blush um, not be so apparent what this quote has to do with meditating and zazen, but I promise you I'll loop around. So it comes from a, a, an extraordinary book. It's called The Practice of the Wild by Gary Snyder. It's a book I've read many times, and every time I pick it up, it's like uh, I'm learning something else from it. And it's an essay called The Etiquette of Freedom. And is freedom's our national myth. Freedom's what we seek in enlightenment. Freedom is the way we chafe, or the image of freedom is the way we chafe against restrictions. In, uh, in Gary's universe, or the universe that we're actually in, that Gary's actually describing, it has quite a specific um, referent. So I want to read the quote that um, that I posted. Our bodies are wild. The involuntary quick turn of the head at a shout. The vertigo looking off a precipice. The heart in the throat in a moment of danger. The catch of the breath. The quiet moments Relaxing, staring, reflecting. All universal responses of this mammal body. They can be seen throughout the class. Meaning, these are behaviors that you can see in any mammal. The body does not require the intercession of some conscious intellect to make it breathe. To keep the heart beating. It is to a great extent self-regulating. It is a life of its own. Sensation and perception do not exactly come from outside. And the unremitting thought and image flow are not exactly outside. The world is our consciousness. It surrounds us. The conscious and the planning ego occupies a very tiny territory a little cubicle somewhere near the gate, keeping track of some of what goes in and out, sometimes making expansionistic plots, and the rest takes care of itself. The body is, so to speak, in the mind. They are both wild. I'm going to go on just a little bit. Language is a mind-body system that co-evolved with our needs and nerves. Meaning we didn't invent it. Like imagination and the body, language rises unbidden. It is of a complexity that eludes our rational intellectual capacities. All attempts at scientific description of natural languages have fallen short of completeness. Without conscious device, we constantly reach into the vast word hordes in the depth of the wild unconscious. We cannot as individuals or even as a species take for this power. It came from someplace else. From the way clouds divide and mingle and the arms of energy that coil first back and then forward from the way the many flowerlets of a com blossom divide and redivide, from the gleaming calligraphy of the ancient woods under present riverbeds of the Yukon River streaming out of the Yukon Flats, from the wind in the pine needles, from the chuckles of grouse in the ceanothus bushes. So I think what's worth paying attention I mean, it's all worth paying attention. But the idea that we are intimately connected and our extrusions of the essential wildness of the universe 
may strike some people as uh, unsettling. We take great pride as humans in our accomplishments and our differences from the animals. But we are animals. And we're animals with our own particular capacities and quirks and talents and failings. Most animals are faster than we are. Some can fly, many can outrun us, many can eat us. There's a saying, your ass is somebody a meal, which as Gary points out is just a brusque way of describing interdependence. But it's worth recognizing that, well, first of all, what wild really means is self-regulating. The difference between wild and domesticated. Wild is self-regulating. Redwood trees grow for redwood trees. Uh, plants grow up for plants. Skinks exist for skinks. Deer exist for deer. We all share the same universe. And it's pretty non-hierarchical, except in our own minds. Uh, I had a friend a long time ago named Tim Treadwell who got fascinated with bears. And he used to go up to Alaska and he had a little island where he would go and he would commune with the bears. And he had a kind of romantic notion of nature and the bears, which is ultimately disrespectful. And he used to send me pictures of huge grizzly bears laying asleep across his legs. And I would write him and say, Tim, this is, this is not a good idea. Um, these are not your friends. These are independent creatures. They have their own organizing principles. And you need to respect the boundaries. And then Tim and his girlfriend were both eaten by a bear, by a rogue bear. Um, and a camera was left on, the soundtrack was left on. And it was recorded, and the film was made about him and his life. So I mention that to introduce the idea of respect. Both self-respect, taking yourself with all the due respect as being made by that which made butterflies and hummingbirds and dolphins, a self-regulating organism whose mind is wild and who is plugged in by numerous umbilical cords to the entire universe. There was not an umbilical cord between us and the sun, no us. Between us and water, no us. So the notion that we are moving with and through and coexisting as wild creatures, I find relaxing. I find that it me of a lot of responsibility. I don't have to take so much time and attention and the end. I can just kind of be here in this planet where I was put and evolved as part of a long chain of humans that evolved here. On the news this morning, in the discussion of the fires, my old boss, Jerry Brown, came on with really intense clarity. And in speaking of the fires, he was pointing out that this is unlike anything he's seen in his lifetime. And the political failings, he said, I've been a politician for 50 years. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen such a dereliction of duty. And he points out that as a consequence, on top of having to mitigate carbon by limiting the burning of fossil fuels, we're going to have to spend billions and billions of dollars managing our forests, hiring more firemen, building more helicopters, getting more fire trucks, prohibiting people from building wherever they want. This is a consequence of a long drought 
and global warming, climate change. The trees are tinder dry, the underbrush is tinder dry. The heat lightning in, in um, August was something new. Thirteen fires were set by these strikes. So this is the world we're in. And when I say we don't have to take responsibility for it, I don't mean that we can do nothing. We are humans and we do have these capacities. We caused these problems. And we caused these problems to some degree by not wanting to settle and accept the wild and accept our place in it. We could say it's greed. They say one of the first things that happened on the frontier was that um, the women received early Sears catalogs and they saw all the goods that were in the distant cities. And the men saw the tools in the distant cities and they wanted them. And they had to turn the prairies into money. I'm trying to remember the name of um, the guy who runs the Prairie Institute, but who stated that the great breach of nature in Western society was the freeboard plow, a plow that struck inches deep, turning over the wild grass systems of the prairie. I want to read another little quote about the frontier because we have enough memory of the frontier that this will this will remind us of a barrier of no of a boundary that we we failed to take advantage of it's often said that the frontier gave a special turn to american history a frontier is a burning edge a frazzle a strange market zone between two utterly different worlds. It's a strip where there are pelts and tongues and tits for the tip. There is an almost visible line that a person of the invading culture could cross, out of history and into the perpetual present, a way of life attuned to the slower and steadier processes of nature the possibility of passage into that myth-time world had been all but forgotten in Europe. Its rediscovery, the unsettling vision of a natural self, has haunted the Euro-American people as they continually cleared and roaded the many wild corners of the nook and continent. Wilderness is now, for much of North America, places that are set aside on public lands, Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management. These are the shrines saved from land that was once known and lived on by the original people. The little bits left as they were. The last little places where intrinsic nature totally wails, blooms, nests, glints away. They make up only 2% of the land of the United States. So when settlers came here, they really had a choice they could have made if they hadn't carried the narratives and the visions and the history of Europe with them. People could have looked around and say, oh, so this is the way, this is the way people live here. There's a famous story about um, uh, Greenland. When uh, the Norwegians settled Greenland, they brought their cows with them and they built stone houses and they replicated the culture of the European mainland. And they starved to death to the last person. And literally on the other slope of the hill, Inuit people, Eskimo people, were fat and sassy, living off duck and fish, uh, floating their kayaks, hunting with spears and bows and arrows, and completely harmonized with environment and the way they lived. This is not to suggest that, um, well, it's to state blankly that we took a wrong turn. And the wrong turn went a lot farther back. The wrong turn began somewhere in the tradition with Descartes and Newton, city guys who were afraid of chaos, hated disorder, 
and they came up with mechanistic models of the universe that would amplify them. And we've been living there ever since. And the reason why people can cut down 450-year-old redwood trees is impunity is because the spirits were banished from them centuries and centuries before. They were just mechanistic parts of a universe where parties swapped like auto wreckers. And we're in the midst of the consequences of that world. I won't, I won't blame it on Christianity or Judaism. But Judaism was a herder culture. They were farmers. In Genesis, humans are given dominion over the universe. And that the has been turned into a one-way power. Instead of thinking of dominion as if you have responsibility for some, if you have power over something, you have responsibility for it. You have to take care of it. We've turned it into, we can do whatever the hell we want with it. And we're living in that world. We're living in the consequences of that world where man sees himself as separate from nature, separate from natural forces. It's all there for the taking. Very, very, very different than indigenous minds everywhere. Everywhere. And we tend to romanticize Native American cultures. We like the style, the Santa Fe and Millionaires are wearing old squash blossoms that they bought, that the Indians had the pawn to buy wool and dyes to make blankets. We symbol an attachment of nature, and even environmentalism is an expression of dualism. I'm here, there's the environment, the environment has to be in good shape, or I'm not in good shape. Well, the environment's not in good shape, and we're not in good shape. Tension is rampant. Anxiety is rampant. Thousands of people are being displaced. Homes are burned. Lifetimes turned upside down. And this is not a personal event. And yet very often, our pursuit of spiritual depth can be regarded as a personal event. I certainly did. When I first learned about Zen and read about enlightenment, I thought, that's what I want. I'm not just going to be a little fat, mouthy kid. I'm going to be an enlightened guy. I'm going to know the answer to everything. And um, I said about reading about Zen and just anesthetizing my school with mindless Zen quotes and koans that I pretended to understand. There's a great little quote here about native people. Yeah. People of wilderness cultures rarely seek out adventures. If they deliberately risk themselves, it's for spiritual rather than economic reasons. Ultimately, all such journeys are done for the sake of the whole, not as some private quest. So, a medicine man who mediates between the world and nature, is doing this to keep a balance. It may look like he's curing an individual, but he's actually curing or she's actually curing an imbalance between the human community and the natural community. And sometimes when we seek personal relief for personal suffering, we're actually just solidifying the way in which we feel separate and isolated. And this is why Buddha placed such great emphasis on the Sangha, the group of people that study together, the group of people that correct one another. People like myself really enjoy the sequester. Uh, neither my sister or I somehow was dealt the lonely gene. So I love the quiet. I love being left alone. I love the time to meditate, to walk around, daydream.
do what I have to do, take care of my garden. But there are many, many people that can't stand to be alone. The bars are full of them. Drug addiction, alcohol addiction, gambling addiction, sexual addiction, all kind of futile attempts to stop the flow of thoughts that people can't live with for one reason or another. Suppose we considered those thoughts not just personal. They have, they have personal content, that's to be sure. But everybody understands anxiety. But because of our different histories, everybody's anxiety is slightly different. But if we could understand that we're all in this, we're all human beings walking around the planet, sleeping, eating, pooping, fornicating, raising children. We're animals. It'd be hard for one to lord it above another. In the big scheme of things, what's a lot of money mean? It means a lot of, a lot of the indulgences and pleasures and privileges that an urban environment can give you, but certainly doesn't guarantee happiness, certainly doesn't guarantee contentment, certainly doesn't guarantee anything happening for the benefit of others. And in this supposedly Christian nation, I'm struck often by how little regard there is for Jesus' actual words about how difficult it is for a rich man to get into heaven. Something about a camel in the eye of a needle. But when you think about it, people who amass huge fortunes for themselves, more than they need, are taking it from others. And we can say they're being compensated for a gift or a talent or whatever. But that imbalance is not corrected by the gift. It never is. And when those personal fortunes are turned into trust funds on which they don't pay taxes, and those monies are under their direct control, those monies are not for the whole. Those monies are to solve personal personal predilections. I think it's compassionate to send water filters to Africa to save little black children. The problem with it is there are no structures or rules against the corporations that are polluting the water. And neither is there anything stopping the man who's giving the money away from investing in those corporations. And if that person paid their taxes and paid their share of living in a hole in the country, we might have better schools, we might have daycare, we might have things that would save a lot of black lives right here, a lot of poor lives right here. So the reason I mention it is not, not to say uh, that we should feel guilty, but that by mining these connections, by mining the ways in which we are and we participate with wildness, we have opportunities to make tiny restitutions. We have opportunities to learn from the way plants spring up after a forest fire. These trees have lived through forest fires before. When Mount St. Helens blew up and the trees were scattered like toothpicks, it wasn't long between plants were, before plants were growing up among them and wildlife was coming back. It's tough to watch. It's tough to, to witness the suffering that's going with it. But in terms of a threat to nature, I don't think so. The force that through the green fuse drives the flower is driving everything. It's driving us. It's driving the clouds, it's driving the flowers to grow up amidst the ghosts of the trees.
So when we sit zazen, one thing we can do is not think about our personal enlightenment. Because the idea of a personal enlightenment is like the idea of a personal self that we can wash and wax, groom, clip, groom into some kind of perfect thing. But it's really an expression of a kind of self-centered thinking that defeats us. I sit on my cushion, meditating, I'm here, I'm imagining enlightenment over there. Hmm, how am I going to get them together? You're not. You're thinking of them as two different things. You've named them, we've named them, we've reified them. So something else has to happen. We have to drop below our own narratives, our own descriptions of the universe. And when we do that, we're in the wild country. We never know what's going to come across the spinal telephone. And one of the reasons we sit and practice this posture and these mudras is to make our bodies strong enough to withstand the shocks that sometime arise as we see ourselves clearly, as we see the world clearly, as we remember things we've done to others, as we review old hurts. We don't flinch. We sit with what is. Right now, what is is a pandemic. And right now, what is is these disastrous fires. And also, what is is a political system where for at least the last few years, people have been concentrating on personal wealth. Personal people have been describing government as the enemy. What did Ronald Reagan say? The eight most dangerous words or hated words on the planet are, hi, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. Well, we really see the folly of that, don't we? But when he said that and when he fired 11,000 striking air traffic controllers, the entire corporate sector followed him into a war on unions. They weakened the National Labor Relations Board, they set up right-to-work states, and they destroyed the wealth-producing mechanism of the middle class. And the long-term result of that is the president we have. And when the Democrats followed suit and realized they could go after the same big money that the Republicans go after, they were more generous in social policy. You could put it anywhere. You could do it with anyone. They shared more of what they stole. But the end result was that blue-collar people, rural people, teachers, daycare workers, orderlies in the hospitals, all these people were kind of left behind. And the pursuit of single-minded success has produced the world we're in a political system organized around money as opposed to organized around wisdom. So I'd suggest that one of the reasons we sit and clarify ourselves and drop follies away and abandon shed our narratives like snakeskins is that we know on some deep level that the world needs people who are clear-headed and able to keep their heads when everything's going wacky around them. We're needed and we're setting ourselves up to be those people. Because without people who are willing to serve and without a system that rewards service, we're sunk. I can never get over the fact that the, the most obvious Gordian knot snarling and tangling up our system, our political system, is the fact that it's organized around money and no one talks about it. No one comes up with a plan. They say, oh, we have to get the money out of politics. But that's like a New Year's resolution. What's the plan? What do we do? So the Supreme Court has said that the giving of money is free speech, really? That means if you have more money than I do, you have more speech than I do. 
That doesn't seem like a reasonable way to build a, a culture. The Supreme Court has said that corporations are people and they have all the rights and protections of the Bill of Rights. So we can't examine corporate misdeeds because they claim uh, Fifth Amendment rights. They claim their pa papers are free speech and protected. When lobbyists can give money to legislators and they give most of the money, 60 to 60 to 65 percent of both parties' campaigns are organized by big money. Hedge funds, real estate, insurance, private wealth. That's who puts the legislators in office. And when they get in office, no matter what they say to us, the focus groups, they find the buzzwords that'll get us to vote for them. But once they're in office, simple logic insists that they begin paying back their donors, which they do through tax breaks and through legislation which are invisible to us. So part of the anger and the confusion of people around us is that they don't know how, how things got so screwed up. Because the man or woman that shakes their hand and remembers their names and looks at pictures of their kids and takes pictures with them is in Washington doing what they have to do to survive, which is make sure they have a constant stream of money from the major donors. And that's not we money. That's me money. So when we meditate, we don't want to just be replicating me thinking because we can see where me thinking gets us. Me thinking gets us to the United States of America in 2021. Gets us to Western European culture, corporate dominance, the rise of popular the immigrant feelings because everywhere the corporate sector is dominant, they take over the parliaments, they take over the democratic process the people wind up being short-sheeted and they respond reflexively, not always so intelligently. And we see populism and we see anti-immigrant stuff coming. So what can we do? Well, we can remind us every day that we are we people and that when we sit, we sit for the entire world. When you sit, the entitled of your mind, which is not different from the rest of the universe, is calm and tranquil. So we say the whole world sits. And the people that do that, there's a cumulative effect of having more and more clear-eyed, calm people willing to serve others. And that's actually the example of the Buddha's vows be our numberless i vow to save them that means i'm going to model behavior that you can replicate so that that vow can go on through all time don't want to talk you to death here So it seems to me there are two models at work right now. Right now in the Amazon, people I know recently are struggling to protect indigenous people from being overrun by gold miners and cattle ranchers and loggers. Cowboys and Indians is still going on. And the Indians are still being slaughtered. And it's not that the Indians are uh, some cultural pet. It's that the Indians are us. The Indians are our wild nature. The Indians are our encyclopedia of how wild nature actually works. What the plants are good for. What the berries are good for. What the habits of the animals are. They're people who live on natural systems. They're not regulated. They're not plowed. They're not planted in rows. They're not 
fertilized with nitrogen fertilizers that then poison the water and the wild birds. They take their chances. They're plucky, they're gutsy, they don't snivel, and they live a slower, regulated, less, less materially plush, but certainly far freer life than any of us do with our responsibilities of debts and mortgages and jobs and tuition and this and that. And we need to know what they know. We don't have to abandon civilization, but we have to make it permeable. And we have to make our minds and our prejudices permeable to wilderness. And I think we do that by understanding that we are essentially wild. The mind is an ungovernable wilderness. Language is an ungovernable wildness. Our bodies are wild. There are processes going on. There are things living in us that we have no control over. And rather than fighting them, to actually honor them and study them and intuit a way of interacting with them. The rabbit doesn't blame the hawk for eating it. They each have a role to play. But the hawk doesn't take more than it needs. There's a Haida expression about life being the edge of a sharp blade, meaning its lessons can be dramatic. Its lessons can be sudden. Its lessons can be terminal. But it's that blade which has each wild thing being the best iteration of itself. Each wild person the best iteration of itself because their system doesn't support indulgences. Ours does. And all of us are subject to it. It's impossible not to be. So there's something to be said. I'm going to close with this last quote. There's something to be said for getting rid of stuff. Okay, here's the last thing I'm going to read. Great insights have come to some people only after they have reached the point where they had nothing left. Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca became unaccountably deepened after losing his way and spending several winter nights sleeping naked in a pit in the Texas desert under a north wind. He was traveling with, uh, not Cortez, but one of the early Spanish explorers that got wrecked in Florida. And he walked from Florida to Texas to Mexico, got back to Spain. He truly had reached the point where he had nothing. After that, he found himself able to heal sick native people he met on his way westward. His fame spread ahead of him. Once he way back to Mexico and was again civilized a Spaniard, he found he had lost his power of healing. Not just the ability to heal, but the will to heal, which is the will to be whole. For as he said, there were real doctors in the city and he began to doubt his powers. To resolve the dichotomy of the civilized world and the wild, we must first resolve to be whole. I'll repeat it. To resolve the dichotomy of the civilized world and the wild, we must resolve to be whole. People of wilderness cultures rarely seek out adventures. If they deliberately risk themselves, it's for spiritual rather than economic reasons. Ultimately, all such journeys are done for the sake of the whole, not some private quest. Food for thought. May all beings be filled with loving kindness. May all beings be free from suffering. May all beings be happy and at peace. May all beings be filled with loving kindness. May all beings be free from suffering. May all beings be happy and at peace. May all beings be filled with loving kindness. May all beings be free from suffering. May all beings be happy and at peace.